I sometimes get accused of being weird or teaching a weird course, and you know, to me, that's a compliment. When I think of great Americans, I don't necessarily think of presidents first. I think of you know the Three Stooges, John Waters, Mink Stoll. You know, I see people in class sometimes looking at me. I think they think that I'm evil or something like that. Yeah, it, actually, as it turns out, we're both gay. Um, when we met each other, I knew I was gay, but I don't think Jeannie knew she was gay, and and um, married each other and had a wonderful daughter. And it's I like to tell people we're a 21st century family. I'm a music teacher at Eastern Illinois University, and I also teach fine arts courses once in a while. He had a very different approach when he first when you first got in the class with him it was he first came out just talking about himself as opposed to like the class so like talking about his family history and just like the fact that he was a homosexual also was like the biggest point that he was trying to get across i am gay and actually my wife is too though that's a long story people coming out at, you know, different ages and things like that um <clears throat> she knew that when we married and it's just a very complicated thing my daughter is straight Oh, we have a daughter who's a fabulous 28-year-old person in Chicago who does piano, plays piano, and does ballet, teaches ballet to little kids, and has also been an actress. His viewpoints were very eccentric, and he did express them the first day, such as that he was gay, his wife was gay, but his wife didn't realize she was gay until they were married, but they had a daughter, and she was straight. Like, I didn't feel that needed to come out, <laughs> maybe not the first day, and maybe not at all. When he first told us about his like family and stuff, it made it kind of loosened people up. I guess they're like, "Well, this isn't what I expected." Um, Gigi Allen, people have heard of Gigi Allen. G period, G period, A L L N. He would uh, shit on stage and eat it, and then throw some of it at the you audience. What? Gigi Allen. No, what did you say? He would, eat? He, he would shit on stage and eat it. Sit on stage, right? And then throw some of the audience. and people would watch that. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. He'd bring up different art forms, like the more radical art forms, like talking about Gigi Allen and the, I forget the guy's name, who came up with, who pickled his penis in a jar and put it on display. Otto Mule, there's a guy named Otto Mule, M-U-E-H-L, he makes maybe the most radical images I've ever seen. He gets people together and they actually drink animals out of each other's bodies through tubes in a circle. It's one of the most radical things I've ever seen. It was just like a breath of fresh air compared to like a regular boring college class. I could tell like he was going to be completely different from any teacher I'd ever had before, like the first day of class, you know, and I could tell he was going to, you know, be kind of an oddball, you know. I think I just evolved into it a little bit. You know, I was really into John Cage's chance music, and I started showing a John Cage video eventually, and... You know, I play his music on audio cassette, and I talk about the political implications of his music. And so little by little, I started talking about other radical artists, like John Waters and Robert Maplethorpe and all kinds of other people I could list. And so I've kind of evolved into doing this. When I first started teaching at Northern, I wasn't saying some of the things I say now. And, you know, I just felt that this was really necessary really important, just like Cage evolved into doing chance music, he didn't start out doing that. Talking about whether art can be great even if it's disgusting, I decided that was probably more important for people to think about than being able to write out three different kinds of minor scales in a music appreciation course. So I started emphasizing what I thought was really important, which is some of these things that seem to be controversial. I was shown recently something on the internet called Two Girls, One Cup. Anybody see that? Then you know all about it. Well, need I say more? Um, if you can see that and get into that, which I think is an example of performance art, you could call that art. Um, if you haven't seen it, I guess God, almost everybody's seen it here. I'm the only one who hadn't seen it. Yeah, these two women shit in a cup and then they eat it and then one of them's throwing it up into the other one's mouth. It is gross, it is gross. But is it art? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's a film, and I guess I'd say, you know, it's, it's performance art. 
strangely enough, you get in trouble sometimes when you talk about these things because people think you're introducing irrelevant material. And that's why some people come after me. They say, well, he, he said something about a film or an artwork, and it's not music, and the course is supposed to be music. So, you know, on the one hand, the university encourages you to talk about interdisciplinary things, and then when you go to do it, you get accused of introducing irrelevant material. Anybody know who Annie Sprinkle is? She gives lectures like she did at the University of Chicago. Uh, she believes that people don't know enough about the female body, so she gives a speech about the female body, and then she sits on stage, and anybody who wants to stands online, and they look up her vagina uh, to see the cervix. And people don't know, you know, where's the cervix? You know, where, what is all that with all that stuff down there? So, you know, people get online, they kind of look up there and look, at the, look for the cervix. It's called public cervix announcement. Pretty funny, it seems to me. Annie Sprinkle is fabulous. She's been a porn star, a prostitute, I read her latest book, and she says that she's achieved spirituality through being a porn star and a prostitute. Now, who's to say how a person becomes more spiritual? That may be the most important thing in the world, becoming more spiritual, becoming more open and tolerant and you know, generous, kind person. I, maybe that's the thing we should all be aiming for. We have a video of her. If you want to see her, it's over at the library. It's called Sluts and Goddesses Video Workshop. The movie has to do with a number of women talking about female masturbation. I think Annie Sprinkle is great. She's an example of a radical artist who's making the world a better place, as far as I'm concerned. So you might want to Google some of these people, see what they're up to. They tend to not like the radical artworks that, are, that you talk about. It's okay to talk about Rembrandt and Tolstoy and Michelangelo and Leonardo and, you know, the Greek playwrights, but if you talk about Otto Mule or Gigi Allen or Rudolf Schwarzkogler or Robert Maplethorpe, Annie Sprinkle, John Waters, you know, people have a problem. A student in an Eastern Illinois music class is going public with her complaint that some class material is objectionable. She says some sexually explicit material offended her, but her professor says he's only trying to broaden his students' horizons. Three other students have now joined in that complaint. Because the way I view it is, you know, it started now, and it's always slightly been there as a problem in the universities and in higher education. Um, eventually it's going to drift down into our high schools. I think some students just have some trouble uh, hearing, you know, Freudian and feminist analyses and hearing references to radical artworks. They may not be used to that. The Bianco says the complaints center on two lectures about ideology and only as much as five minutes of the course. The more we turn our, turn our backs to what's going on, it's just going to increase it and we're going to allow more and more things to be acceptable in, in our society. And, you know, that's why we're having more and more problems out there with, you know, people getting murdered. It's what we accept. They just, people just need to understand that in order to judge any art, you have to know the most radical examples. And I just want people to be open to new analyses and be tolerant. Adam says if she didn't complain, the material might eventually end up in other classes, but the professor says the fuss is over just a small portion of his class. In a television interview, she said she is concerned that such subjects might seep down to high schools. Please, please pass along the following advice to her. First, learn the meaning of cultural diversity. Second, if you are really concerned about high schools, don't become a teacher. The profession can't tolerate the narrow-minded, anti-intellectual view you express. Third, let the teachers teach. Your job is to learn, and that is quite enough for you to do right now and for a long time to come. Wow, that was beautiful. I can tell you the kind of people have been offended and have made the biggest fuss about what I've done. Every single one of the major complaints, and there have been, I don't know, four, five, six, depending on which one account, every single person's been an elementary ed major, female, almost all of them from small towns around here, almost all of them talking about how their Christianity was offended. Those are the people who are, seem to be offended. I don't think I'm offending the average history major or philosophy major. It's, it's these people who live sheltered lives and they think he really shouldn't say stuff like that in class because I wouldn't say that to my third graders. So Charleston itself is a quiet, 
rural town, but having the university there keeps it, you know, uh, I think a little demanding of having, you know, academic minds, you know. So there's farmers and there's professors living in the same town very nicely. This is where the Bible Belt begins, and you do get Christian fundamentalists in class, people who've lived in small towns all their life. Their religion is the only one anybody in the town believes, and it's the only thing they know. And all of a sudden, I'm talking about sending a turd through the mail and John Waters' pink flamingos, and you know, they're just mortified. It's a rather conservative town. I even felt the influences. I mean, you know, I remember in second grade, somebody asking me about Joan of Arc, and I didn't know who Joan of Arc was, really, and they told me I was gonna go to hell. You, you get letters to the editor of the local newspaper, all these super religious fanatic letters all the time. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you think you're living in the deep south or something. If mm -hmm. I'd cut all this stuff out, I probably wouldn't have had any controversy. Um, you know, it's not 100% essential that you talk about Gigi Allen shitting on stage and eating it and throwing it at the audience. You can leave that out. You know, they're freshmen and they haven't been exposed to very much at all. And, and Doug's been doing this for a long time. and. Just bringing up one little thing would be a far out for them, and just hitting them with everything all at once, I think, was, is a lot, especially for the ones who came from a farm community, like 100 people in their town. You know, the, the classroom, you just never know who is a Christian fundamentalist, and I don't ever want to hurt their feelings, um, but they are so rigid about certain things. They're just not open. I don't know if in their whole life they'll ever open up and, and you do kind of wonder sometimes. I don't ever mean to hurt their feelings, but they, they're sitting there and, and you know, they look at me like I'm their worst nightmare. This committee, you know, simply took Tarasetch's diary, where she says things like, today he said the word lesbian two times, and condemns me, writes a letter to my chairman, and writes and makes copies for all kinds of other administrators on campus, and somebody leaks the letter to the newspaper, which I'm told is illegal, and your next thing you know, there are headlines, committee recommends students not take professor's course. They don't like the fact that, uh, that I'm teaching things in this 20-page bibliography. I was, and I was teaching almost nothing from that bibliography. It was an all-purpose bibliography for all of my courses, the regular Western music courses, non-Western music. Uh, there were lists of books on reincarnation. Uh, there were self-help books. There were um, books on film, what I thought all the main books on film were. It was, you know, like a gift to my students of, you know, here are some things that have really influenced me. You know, I think you might enjoy looking into. And they assumed I was teaching all this stuff. There were gay and lesbian books listed. They assumed I was teaching all this stuff in the non-Western music course. It was given out on probably the last day of class. I wasn't teaching that stuff. All they had to do was ask me, and I would have told them. To whom it may concern, I would like to comment on Music 3562C, a class taught by Dr. DiBianco, which I attended as a student in the fall of 1995. I was aware of the controversy surrounding Dr. DiBianco's teaching before I signed up for his class, but it was a class that I needed to take. Dr. DiBianco is the only professor that teaches non-Western music. I read of the charges that had been brought against Dr. DiBianco in the previous semesters. I feel that I am an open-minded person, and I tried to go into the class as such, despite what I had heard and previously read. I attended the class every day, only missing one excused day. Many days I found Dr. DiBianco's choice of topics very inappropriate and unnecessary. I know that the charges previously brought against him were for sexual harassment. I do not feel that I nor anyone else in the class was sexually harassed, but I do question the legitimacy and validity of some of Dr. DiBianco's choice of topics. He very often talked of things having to do with sex and sexual orientation. I was very offended by some of the things Dr. DiBianco talked about in class. After a couple of days, I started keeping track of some of the phrases and topics he used that I felt were inappropriate. I kept track of most of them in the margin of my notes, although some are contained within my class notes. I would like to share with you these phrases and topics that Dr. DiBianco used that I felt were inappropriate. I dated my notes and have done so in typing them out. 
I have also included a copy of my actual notes and copies of the handouts given to us in class. What I have written on my handouts is what Dr. DiBianco said about them. 8.22.95, I had not yet started documenting. 8.24.95, I had not yet started documenting. So those were the first couple days of class? Yeah, that's when I actually talked about Pinocchio and Snow White. So she didn't get those in there. She missed some of the best ones. 8.29.95, sex was mentioned seven times. Gay people. Semen was mentioned twice. Gay. Anally retentive. Sexual practices was mentioned four times, and men being with boys was mentioned. I was talking about the Atoro tribe in New Guinea that feels young boys don't have enough semen, and so for 11 of the 12 months of the year, they go out into the mountains and they engage in oral sex so the boys can acquire more semen. It's a sacred fluid. It's an anthropological practice. That's probably why I would use the word semen. 9595. Gay was mentioned twice. I think it's kind of funny, personally. I think when she's saying, like, gay was mentioned twice, like, so what? <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, personally, I just think that's unnecessary. I don't know, saying the word gay, how does that offend, how, do, how does that offend you? It, it, I don't know, it's their own opinion, I guess. It doesn't offend me. Is it really necessary? I don't know. Should he have talked about it? Maybe not. But it doesn't offend me. I might have told him I was the advisor to the gay and lesbian group on campus. That might have been one mention of gay. And maybe I told him I thought Bugs Bunny was gay. There's a great article by Hank Sartan in um, Windy City Times a number of years ago, and he suggests Bugs Bunny is gay. So maybe that was what I mentioned. I guess every time I said the word gay, you know, even, you know, in some passing comment, she made note of it or tape recorded and then just went back through and counted it. At that time in 1995, I suppose just hearing the word gay in a class was pretty unusual for a lot of people. 9795, told of a teenage lesbian. I probably mentioned the lesbian movie I'd seen at the New Art Theater in Champaign called The Incredibly True Adventures of Two Girls in Love. I think that's what was going on in 95. I'll bet I, I think I probably mentioned it and said I saw this lesbian movie over the weekend and it was great. You know, when, when people make comments like that, it's all out of context. They never mention why I was saying what I was saying. I'm trying to encourage people to go to foreign films, good American films, independent films, uh, and, and they, there's never any context. It's like I was standing there and for no reason at all, I launched into this 20-minute dissertation about teenage lesbians. I mean, there's certainly nothing wrong with teenage lesbians. 9-21-95. Human sexuality. Sexual. Gay samurai. Orgies. Penises. Lovers. Well, gay samurai, and there were gay samurai. There was a whole code of homosexuality among samurai and, and younger samurai. I just heard a whole lecture about that. There's a, there's a book in the library about gay samurai. Orgies. I used to say... I probably, I, I haven't said this for a while, especially since the AIDS virus has been around. I used to say that, you know, the ancient Greeks had virtual orgies on their way to see the famous plays. And uh, it would probably be a good idea to do that at Eastern, you know, once a semester or once a year. People's grades would probably go up instead of spending all their time trying to pick each other up in the bars. Maybe they would profit by, you know, campus orgies. But I don't know, especially with the AIDS virus going around, I've kind of... I haven't said that for a while. 10-10-95. Sexuality. Sexually tense. Heterosexual weddings. Sensual. Sensuality. I don't remember that at all. I might have said that, um, I might, it's possible I was criticizing some of the advice columns for the, the endless celebration of heterosexual weddings and, and, um, you know, what side of the bride should the little girl with the ring stand on and what color should the pillow be it might have been something like that and I, I I've occasionally told them when my wife and I got married we went to a justice of the peace in Kalamazoo Michigan and a couple of our friends had just happened to come down for the weekend and we decided gee you know maybe it's time we got married we've been living together for a while and our parents were probably wondering when are they ever gonna get married so we went to this justice of the peace and I had brought some Mozart records and put them on his little 
kitty record player and um, I asked him you know this is gonna take too long is it we got to make a nine o'clock movie so he said no 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 it'll be okay so we you know we did the ceremony and you know when people love each other what the ceremony you know what do you even have to have a ceremony it, um, so we uh, we got married we dropped by a fast food place for a cheeseburger and then we made Eric von Stroheim's greed but I, I don't even remember it. Some of these things, you know, they you never know what they're going to complain about. Sensual and sensuality. I have no idea what I was even talking about at that point. Ten seventeen ninety five. Gay. Cross dressing. Lesbian. Semen. Ingesting semen. Doctor DiBianco told us his three favorite religions. I told them that my three favorite religions were probably. Dancing around the golden calf, preferably naked, worshiping giant penises in ancient Greece, and Zen Buddhism. Now, were they really my three favorite religions? I don't know. The more I think about it, maybe they are. But I said it partly because of the musical way the language flows out. It's dancing around the golden calf, preferably naked. So that's da 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 da. Worshipping giant penises in ancient Greece. Da 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 da. That's a little shorter. And then, and Zen Buddhism, that's ta da ta da da. You know, there's a rhythm to the way that flows out. Like in John Waters' movies, he has a fantastic musical ear and he says things that are legato and then things are staccato. And so I used to like saying that. I said that for years. And I used to like saying that because of the, of the, the way the language flowed out. And, um, and, but as I say, the more I think about it, and maybe those probably are, and they might well be my three favorite religions. But, you know, people, some of these religious people are so offended by things like that. I, don't they have any sense of humor? I mean, isn't there something kind of funny about that? Um, but, you know, they, they, they have, they're so literal minded. Um, you know, they think every word in the Bible is exactly true and literal. And so they treat what I say in the same way. 102695. This day we watched a 1928 film called Andalusian Dog. I found his interpretation of the movie, which contained no talking, very offensive. These are some of the phrases he used to describe the movie, and there is also a handout that has his idea of the outline for the movie. Sexual, sexuality, orgasmic climax. Two-thirds of Dalmatians are gay. Nothing good or bad about promiscuity. Same and opposite sex traits. Movies are made for men so they can gaze on women's bodies. Hollywood suggests that a heterosexual relationship is the only way to live. Gay people, masturbation, sexual desire shifts, civilization represses desire, sexuality, parents listen next door as teens have sex in a pleasure house. We perceive everything as penis or vagina in our subconscious. Sex with virginal woman, orgasmic, genital area, Sperm coming out of the head of the penis. Vagina. I did not see the relevancy of this movie to non-Western music. Yeah, okay, I've explained many times why I show that movie. And it's not just because it has Latin American tangos in it. It's because it's, you know, I, I get a chance to show them how you can do a Freudian analysis of an artwork and how complex artworks really are. And people sometimes underestimate the complexity of artworks. And they have political implications people don't always see. That most of what she's complaining about, is, you know, as terminology I used in analyzing Andalusian dog, there are things that seem to be symbolic of masturbation. Um, the ants coming out of the hand could be looked at as sperm coming out of the head of a penis. He always seemed to bring things to a sexual point of view, and at sometimes I didn't think it was necessary. Like I didn't understand how, for instance, in the movie Andalusian dog, he. We had watched that movie, and then he did a critique on it, and he passed a handout on it. And every scene in the movie, he related to related it to some sexual inferences, references. And I just, I didn't see how it related to sexual innuendos, but he did. So I didn't really understand how that had anything to do with non-Western music. Eleven nine ninety five, vagina. <laughs> this one just says vagina. <laughs> Does that mean she just, he just said vagina? Well, I know I didn't show them my vagina because I don't have one. 11-16-95. Instead of shaking hands in an Australian tribe, they shake penises. Eating people is not necessarily bad. 
we will run out of room to bury them. Okay, yeah, there is a tribe in Australia I've read about where when they get together, instead of shaking hands, they shake penises. So I used to say, yeah, instead of saying, hi, how are you doing? They say, hi, how are you doing? So, I don't know, people thought that was pretty funny. I don't know where I read that, but apparently that's true. Um, cannibalism, yeah, I've talked about cannibals and people eating each other. And I remember when the two women sued me in court that one of the complaints was I talked about cannibalism. And I've gotten that complaint several times. Well, I don't know, when you're talking about the music of New Guinea, which is what I was doing, you're showing a tape of people in New Guinea, you're playing maybe music from New Guinea on a cassette. You know, I mentioned that one of the things they're most famous for is cannibalism, which they seem to have stopped. Um, and one of the Rockefellers may have been eaten by them at one point. And I remember sitting in court once with, it wasn't, it was like a, trying to get us to settle and this judge came in, and he said, the women are complaining that you talked about cannibalism. And I said, yeah, we were talking about New Guinea. And I said, I've even heard there's a tribe in South America where when you're on your deathbed, you get to pick who's going to eat you. Like, you know, Aunt Mary's okay, but I don't know about Aunt Sally. So, uh, you know, and the judge starts laughing, and the lawyers are laughing. And I thought, well, that's, maybe this won't be so bad. Eleven twenty-eight ninety-five. Penis transplant. Oh, penis transplant. That's John Waters. That's in Desperate Living. Yeah, that's a great moment. That's the penis transplant scene in Desperate Living. 11.30.95. Dr. DiBianco talked about the movie Pink Flamingos. Sex with chickens. Singing asshole. Artificial insemination. Penis. Sex change operation. Gay people. Actually eat dog shit. Someone is castrated. Penis is gone. Frontal male nudity. And Dr. DiBianco's favorite line from this movie, There are two kinds of people, my kind and assholes. Dr. DiBianco's favorite line from the movies, I wouldn't suck your dick if I were suffocating and there were oxygen in your balls. Okay, that's a whole litany of great stuff from Pink Flamingos. Um, she's, he's been castrated, his penis is gone. You know, I use that as an example of the Baroque. I mean, really, it's, it's more is more. You know, Mink Stoll says that when she sees uh, Channing Wilroy castrated in the basement. But those lines from Pink Flamingos, oh, I and mean, those are my, some of my favorite things in life. Um, the, the first one's from Pink Flamingos. Okay, Mink Stoll is sitting there at a desk, and she's just rejected this woman named Sandy Sandstone uh, who wants to spy on Divine. She wants the job spying on Divine. Mink Stoll's competing with Divine to see, you know, who's the filthiest person alive. And Mink Stoll rejects this woman's application, and the woman's already called her, you're, a, you're just a cunt, a fucking cunt. And so Mink Stoll says, well, Miss Sandstone, I guess there are just two kinds of people, my kind of people and assholes. It's rather obvious which category you fit into. Have a nice day. And Sandy Sandstone leaps up and gives her the finger and says, eat the bird, bitch. You know, it's, it's the perfect example of legato versus staccato, for one thing. Um... It's, you know, Mink Stoll should have won at least six Academy Awards by now. And it's just one of the great moments in John Waters' films, which are filled with great moments. Um, the other line is from Female Trouble, which is my favorite line of all time. I, I actually have written a couple of short encyclopedia articles on John Waters and, and Divine. And I quote this line in the in the article, I even I, the editor I think wanted to change it to this is perhaps one of the greatest lines or something. And I insisted, no, I said I wanted to say this may well be the greatest line of all time, and I mean in films, theater, poetry, novels. I mean even Shakespeare didn't come up with this. Here's Mink Stoll. She's dressed as a fourteen-year-old. Divine's lying in bed. The transvestite actor playing a woman. Next to him is this naked guy called Gator in the movie, like Alligator. The camera, it, 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 she says, me, 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 I caught you in the act. And he says, hey, baby, why don't you come over here and suck your daddy's dick? And the camera zooms in on his penis. And Mink Stoll delivers the greatest line of all time, bar none. She says, I wouldn't suck your lousy dick if I was suffocating and there was oxygen in your balls. So, you know, I, I love to quote that line. I try every semester to quote that line because to me it's an example of not only great art but how you know great art can be disgusting it can be it can be gross it can be obscene and it can still be great art I feel that 
Some of his discussions included moral and personal beliefs and that they should not be discussed in the classroom. I questioned both his motives and his reasoning for the discussion. If that really offended her, she just should have dropped the class. You know, I don't think she should have been outraged. This is college, you know, you have to... I expect teachers to be different here, that different than high school. You know, they're kind of reserved and they have to watch everything they do and say. It should be something at a college level that you should be able to accept. College is a time for you to learn to look at things a new way, and he definitely pushes you to look at them a certain way. I see where the, what they're talking about. You know, he definitely mentioned a lot of these things, but... um. You know, I think that's just who he is, and he always made a point of telling everyone that no one is objective, you know, everyone has their own point of view on things. And yeah, he might mention homosexuality and things like that, but that's who he is, you know, that's where he's coming from. You know, I think it's important, you know, these people are in, in college, you know, I think it's important to, to be open-minded about these things, you know, and if they were offended, you know, they should have just dropped the class, I think. We, we can't take that seriously. It's, it just is not the case that you shouldn't be allowed to talk about certain subjects or bring up certain material in a college classroom just because of the nature of the subject or the nature of the material. She brought this list to the elementary education department's curriculum committee, seven people, and they condemned me in a letter they wrote to my chairman and sent it copies all over campus to different administrators. And they have no sense of the context. All, this, all she's doing is picking out words I say, phrases that I say, a topic which I may address in passing. And they look at this and they seem to think, well, he must have spent the whole hour talking about heterosexual weddings. Uh, I, I, I don't even remember what it was actually in relation to. But that's what these people do when they complain about me. A lot of the complaints about me have been, you know, they pick a word or a sentence that you say or a topic. They take it completely out of context. They don't even begin to explain why you might have mentioned it. And by not mentioning the context, it looks like that's all you're doing. You're not talking for 49 and a half minutes about Chinese opera, and for 30 seconds, you happen to mention you saw a lesbian movie over the weekend. They don't say that. They just say, he said the word lesbian today. And then some of these faculty members don't even call me on the phone and ask me, well, what actually happened? They just assume that this is all bad, and then they condemn me all over campus. It's insane. I think what's really happened is that he does throw in this information here and there, but it's what it's made to look like is that that's all the class is about. And I think what sometimes happens is people focus so much on what has been said that's completely offensive to them and it's out of their box, it's out of any bound, you know, they, this is stuff they've never talked about, never wanted to talk about, that people around them, their community, friends, people like this in their circle, they don't talk about this kind of stuff because it's absolutely disgusting. We don't want to think about it. There is no forbidden topic for a university classroom. It all depends on the context. It depends on the course. Uh, if students are offended by specific content, specific words even, uh, well, that's too bad, but censorship isn't the answer. It's easy to take things uh, out, of, out of context if you, if you only write down the word penis and you write down the word lesbian and you write down the word gay and you say, he said these words, if you look at it in the context in which they were used, they all make sense in that context and are relevant to the course. So you can't, you can't just jump on a professor for using certain words. They don't really get information out of my father's class that he's offering because they're so set upon those, those few ideas that he just, he just throws out here and there in class like any teacher would about his own politics and just an opinion. But he's, the majority of his class, whether it's 50 minutes, an hour and a half, is about non-Western music. It's about musical ideas. It's about what the course is described as. And these are little bits of pieces throughout the semester that he likes to throw out there to kind of engage a person's mind to, to, really, to make them a little uncomfortable that um, what he's talking about. I know the, the shock value is big to him because he, he likes it when things are out of the ordinary. 
even though some of the stuff he says is random and so, in a lot of ways it was kind of weirdly connected, you know, but you know, it just showed his open mindedness, which, you know, to some people I don't want to say they can't handle it, but you know, it's new. And I get accused of, you know, stretching beyond this line, this boundary you're not supposed to go over um, in doing things that are relevant. And I have a very expansive view, I think, of what's possible and what's relevant. So I don't think I've ever gone over the line. I don't think I've ever said an irrelevant word, even an aside. These are, I kind of think about some of them in advance. It may seem spontaneous, but sometimes I've said it for 20 years and I, you know, I, I, I make it seem spontaneous, but that aside has been thought out. I don't think I've ever said an irrelevant word or given an irrelevant handout in all the time I've ever taught. Dr. DiBianco gets criticized when he brings in uh, paintings. Uh, uh, architecture or film like Louis Bunuel, uh, Andalusian Dog, things of this nature, or Pink Flamingos by John Waters. Uh, what is film? What is, uh, what is uh, literature? What does painting have to do with music, right? Well, it doesn't say anything about that in the syllabus. The, the, the course is called Non-Western Music. He brings in John Cage, clearly an American composer, What's he doing in a class of non-Western music? In my opinion, this is Dr. DiBianco's weakest position to defend. I think he does bring in a lot of material, obviously a lot of material, that is not per se Western music. Now, to me, the, the, the question here, and this has never been, to my mind, satisfactorily uh, solved. I haven't actually solved it in my own mind to that degree. How much extraneous material is too much extraneous material? To the point that the class is no longer what it, what it clearly identifies itself as being. Well, when, you, when a course is listed as non-Western music, and it says it's going to be Asian, African, and or South American music, people sometimes assume that's all you're going to talk about. Now, sometimes we've had the word culture in the description, but even if culture isn't in the description, Everybody knows that when you study music, you, you need to talk about the society from which it comes. And so one of the complaints I get is this course in the catalog said it was going to be Asian, African, South American music, and he talked about other stuff. Well, you can't put that in the catalog. That You only get like 12 or 15 words in the catalog. You can't explain that on the first day of class, you're going to tell them that Pinocchio's nose could be looked at as a phallic symbol and art is more complex than people may realize and it has political implications. No, I, how can, I've been accused of, well, he does, it's not in the catalog. Well, of course it's not in the catalog. You know, you talk about other arts, you make references, there are metaphors. You can't put everything in the catalog. We're talking about art in general here. Music is an art form. Now, if we're going to talk about music as an art form, we have to talk about what art is. He's asking large questions of art that he is then going to focus in on in the smaller context of music. From that perspective, I think Dr. DiBianco has a good argument. You've created a framework then for making a particular point or presenting uh, particular ideas or, or a, particular, uh, a particular type of material. And that's the kind of thing that I think we need to make students aware of when we're teaching. We need to make them aware in a class like non-Western music that what's Western, what's non-Western, it's not just a matter of the specific content, it's a matter of the framework within which the content is presented. And it's possible that what Doug DiBianco presents in his class brings out that framework. In which case, I can see that it's relevant. I think it's important, in, you know, if you're going to apply rules and apply restrictions on what professors have to say, it has to be really a content neutral kind of thing. If a professor is not teaching the class, is simply rambling on and on during a class and failing to get to any of the material, then, then that's unethical, that, that's a failure to perform their job. But it's because of what they're failing to do. It's not because they, of what they say. It doesn't matter in that case whether a professor is rambling on and on, uh, criticizing the Bush administration or criticizing the football team. In either case, it's the failure to do their job that would be the problem. Because he brings in, I believe, a lot more what some would call extraneous material than the average class does. 
and it is clearly not non-Western music. In fact, it isn't even music at all, and some of it isn't non-Western. As far as interpretation, interpreting the music differently, um, I don't think that I did. I think if I'm going to listen to music, that's what it's going to be. It's, not, it's going to be music. It's not going to be a video. It's not going to be a movie. It's going to be music. I'm, I'm not musically inclined. I don't have any interest in music, really, except for what I listen to on the radio. So, and my brain doesn't work very artistically, so I can't, I can't think of things. You know, when I make some passing reference or some passing aside that's not related to a piece of music, does that count as talking about music? I mean, every prof does that. When you talk, it's just a matter of you have to talk for an hour or an hour and 15 minutes, whatever. You, you're you going to make asides about other arts and history and something in today's newspaper. And, 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 I, and I don't know, to say that that's irrelevant and that shouldn't count as the percentage you talk about the music, I don't know. I think a rational person could look at this case and say that while he may have the prerogative to do what he's doing, it isn't entirely defensible in terms of the amount that he does it. In all these years, I've basically only changed one thing. Instead of calling Snow White a cock-teasing bitch, I changed it to sex-teasing bimbo. And the reason is because I asked a nice girl in one of my music appreciation classes once, I said, do I say anything that offends you or show anything or hand out anything? The only thing that I can think of that he said that could have pushed the limits was a comment that he made about Snow White. <laughs> um, he said that Snow White was a cock-teasing whore or bitch or something. She said, some women may object to the B word. So I said, oh, okay. So... From then on, I, I just said sex teasing bimbo. I found another B word. I just didn't feel like that needed to be said. That seems to be better for some people. I think he is sort of impishly provocative. He, he sort of likes to tease the students with things. But he does it in a very impish sort of way, like he's a like he's a little bit of a troublemaker. You know what I mean? Not a not a not a mean troublemaker or a or a dangerous troublemaker. But yeah, there's a little bit of the troublemaker in Dr. DiBianco. He's a little devious, okay, with a smile. You know, we're looked at as Walmart employees uh, producing a product, and if somebody doesn't like your class, it's like consumer or customer dissatisfaction with the product they got. They want to turn the product back for a refund. Students wanting their money back because they didn't get what they wanted out of a course is kind of a silly idea. Um, it's predicated on the assumption that the student is a customer and that we are proprietors of some kind of service, like a McDonald's or something like that. And uh, that, of course, is uh, not an appropriate comparison. Uh, what we owe students for the tuition they pay to be here is the opportunity to earn an education. Uh, and uh, they have that opportunity if we are offering these courses, whether they do what they have to do to get something out of that course or not. But there is a, there's an onus on them to do what they have to do as well to uh, take responsibility for their own education. To sit through a whole course and then decide I didn't like the professor, you know, he said stuff I didn't like or I didn't agree with or offended my religion, they, you know, they can't go around giving people their money back, you know. What you see running, uh, people running colleges and universities are not tenured radicals. They're really proponents of a corporate model of management that, that's infecting higher education to a great extent now. And a lot of what conservatives object to, uh, for example, diversity programs or uh, the idea that uh, you shouldn't allow professors to offend minority students, or, or even this new trend of, of the idea that conservative students should be free from being offended, uh, this is really a corporate mentality. It's the idea that students are not students, they're consumers. They're buying a product and they therefore, like other consumers, you know, you don't go into a McDonald's and have your ideas challenged by the guy behind the counter. That's what 
I fear that we're turning higher education into is this idea of this fast food product that's bland and inoffensive and uniform for everyone. There are indeed uh, political pressures upon universities, public universities like this one, uh, to conduct themselves as if indeed they were providing some kind of a service in exchange for taxpayers' money or tuition money and so on. Those pressures come and go. They're, they're stronger at times, weaker at times. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of it depends upon what else is going on. If there is a budget problem in the state, then of course there will be politicians who will look for any reason whatsoever to cut the budget for a university. But they would be looking for those reasons no matter what they were. Uh, and they'll, they'll simply grab what's convenient. And I think that happened a little bit uh, in, in some of these episodes that took place on this campus over the years. The term tenured radical is a, a term conservatives came up basically of denouncing left-wing professors who uh, went to college in the 60s and then uh, now supposedly dominate and occupy uh, the, all of the professorships and administrative positions. The idea is that uh, the term tenured radical is that you have these radical students in the 60s who have now taken their radical values and institutionalized them within higher education. The, the truth is that... Uh, most so-called tenured radicals sold out a long time ago to, to the man. They, they're not radicals anymore. They're driving Volvos and they have retirement plans and they have families and they're, they're not, you know, preaching free love and hippiedom to all of their students. What they may have is, is a liberal political viewpoint or remains, but, uh, to my mind, there are very few radicals in academia. Most of these people uh, are not, you know, it, you'd look long and hard for a professor who's fomenting revolution of any kind. They're all too busy publishing in obscure academic journals to do any of that kind of radical stuff. I think there are people who've made their careers uh, by creating this straw man called the tenured radical. There are people on this campus who have extreme views of the right and the left. They're, they're in the minority. We consider all points of view. Uh, we don't really exclude any point of view, but culturally speaking, politically speaking, uh, this university is, is not a hotbed of anti-American radicalism or anti-Christian radicalism uh, or any other kind of radicalism. I mean, how could it be? It's an institution institutions, by their very nature, uh, have to be broadly based, especially an institution of, of higher learning. Uh, it's true that most u university faculty are politically liberal-leaning, most. But that has uh, more to do with the kinds of people who decide to become professors than anything else. It, it has nothing to do with not hiring professors because they have conservative viewpoints. Dr. DiBianco is probably a tenured radical. He's a, uh, he's tenured and he's a radical. So I guess that makes him a tenured radical. Well, first, I'm, I'm glad that some radicals have tenure. You know, if I didn't have tenure, I probably would have been gone years ago. Um, because, you know, they just don't want to deal with some of these controversies. And, you know, some alumnus writes in and say, I'm not donating any more money to Eastern Illinois University till they fire this guy and uh, somebody else who has no real idea of what I do. Yeah, that's, that was that whole thing about tenured radicals a few years ago. Um, we've got a lot of tenured conservatives. I don't know anybody or any department that ask job candidates what their political views are. Uh, I know in my department that's not a question we would ever ask. It would be totally uh, inappropriate. If we, if we did, we're only concerned with how well can they teach a certain type of philosophy and what are their credentials. Uh, we don't know when we hire a colleague what their political views are. Uh, usually we learn later on after we get to know them after they've been here a while, but it's not something that comes up. It's not something I was ever asked when I had a job interview. 
Uh, and as I say, I don't know of any department on this campus that excludes people who have a particular political viewpoint. How would they know, since that's not really a question that that would legitimately come up in, a, in an interview? You know, I think people need to hear all points of view. And just as they get conservative professors, they ought to be able to get some radical ones once in a while. You know, I believe in radical, progressive teaching, particularly in the arts and humanities, and I think students appreciate that. They, you know, they realize that something different has gone on. His way of thinking is kind of, I mean, some people would think it's a little bit radical, you know, but I just think it's refreshing almost to get a teacher like DiBianco who will tell you, you know, exactly what he thinks and he doesn't even hold back and, you know, he almost kind of wants to shock you in a way, but he's still, you know, that's what he believes. You know, uh, tenure radical means you've got, you've got tenure and now you're safe to brainwash generations of students. That's not du Dr. DiBianco. I get, I get accused of presenting an artwork and doing an interpretation of it and su suggesting that somehow that's the only interpretation. I try to avoid that. I always say, you know, this is just one way of looking at Pinocchio. This is just one way of looking at Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You know, I, when we look at Andalusian Dog, I ask them, you know, what do you think about this? And rarely does anybody have anything to say because it is so complex. And I say, well, here are some ways I think we can look at it. And I have a handout of six or seven different things. So different ways or different motifs, waiting, violence, and uh, problems of communication in technological society. I, I, I present a number of different ways of looking at it. And then when I do my analysis of it, um, the, the analysis is, was very Freudian and sexual. I say, you know, this is only one way of looking at it. And if you don't agree with it, that's fine. But, you know, people really, if they don't agree with it, they should probably come up with some other interpretation, not just say, I don't like it or I don't agree with it. But I'm very conscious of that. I really try as much as possible. Maybe once in a while I don't say that. But I, I, as much as possible, I always say, this is only one way of looking at this artwork. I don't think he justified his use of sexual innuendos with the movie with uh, class at all. I don't think he did, but that was my personal opinion. So I just feel that he wanted to show the movie. He thought the movie was cool. He showed the movie. Yes, there was music in it and stuff like that, but it didn't have anything to do with non-Western music. Do you think he tried to relate it to non-Western music? Um. As far as relating it to non-Western music, he could have, but I, maybe I just didn't get it. I don't know, like, I don't really understand a lot about music, so it's really hard for me. If it's not cut and dry, if it's not black and white, I won't understand it. And with something about Andalusian Dog, that movie was very weird. I didn't understand it to begin with. So if he tried to relate it to non-Western music, maybe I just didn't understand it. I don't know. I didn't look at anything differently. I got lost in the radical things he said, and I was more consumed with trying to figure out how what he was saying related to the movie at all. And I, I didn't think that it did at all. Uh, people speaking from the left-wing point of view often get accused of trying to indoctrinate students. Women's studies teachers, black studies teachers, queer studies teachers. The, 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 somehow, um, anytime you say anything from a left-wing point of view, uh, or you say anything about something gay, you're trying to indoctrinate people into a gay agenda. You know, uh, my only agenda is to get people to think deeply about important things, particularly about music. And, you know, I have no other other agenda than that. Everybody has some kind of agenda. Everybody speaks from a particular um, point of view um, of what century they live in, of their gender, their sexual orientation. You know, everybody has a, a, a point of view. There's no such thing as objectivity. You just try to present things as best you can. And I, I don't even think of indoctrinating people. The very fact that people rebel against what I say means they weren't indoctrinated. I mean, the students aren't empty vessels that I'm trying to pour some information into and indoctrinate them and brainwash them. I'm simply suggesting here's a way of looking at things. It's from a left-wing perspective, or maybe we're talking about something Freudian. I'm not trying to indoctrinate them. I'm trying to get them to think uh, more expansively. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think you really can indoctrinate them. I don't believe that Dr. DiBianco is involved in indoctrination. I, I do know that, that he, gives, uh, he gives a fairly radical viewpoint of art, but what he's trying to do there is say, uh, 
is this art? If, if, you, put, if you put a Rembrandt up there with the class, I, uh, they're, they're going to say, well, of course that's art. But if you put a Robert Maplethorpe up there, uh, certain Robert Maplethorpe pictures in particular, uh, they will be offensive to some people. It, it, if something is morally offensive to an individual, can that still be art? See, this, this, was, this, this, was, uh, this battle was fought out many times in the courts. Uh, you had it with D.H. Lawrence's uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, which was uh, banned, and then uh, found to be, uh, finally, uh, found to be not pornography. You had uh, Allen Ginsberg's poem Howl, which was banned at first, and then was found to be not pornographic. It's, it's, it's an ugly poem, but it's, it, but it's a poem about the ugliness of life. So an ugliness, a poem about the ugliness of life is going to have ugly images. Does that mean that it's not good art? Well, that's the kind of thing that Doug DiBianco, if it's of a sexual nature, when Dr. DiBianco brings these things in the class, he isn't trying to say with Robert Maplethorpe pictures, now, this is the way you ought to have sex. He's saying, here is an artist taking sexual content and giving it to us as art. Is that art or isn't it? You know, people are offended by a lot of different things, and, you know, I want to be sensitive to that. But uh, art can be filthy. I spent my whole life teaching, and the hardest thing I've ever had to do is to try to convince people that art does not have to be genteel or pleasurable or beautiful in the usual sense. It can be gross and disgusting and still be art. Um, you even see stuff on television. You see the jackass movies, which I think are great. And, uh, and you see all kinds of disgusting stuff. And that doesn't mean it's not art. Um, disgusting is just, you know, the subject matter. The question is, what are they trying to show us about life? And if they're trying to show us stuff about life that's interesting, it can be a great artwork. So art is not necessarily what is pretty. And people try to define art that way. If it's not pretty, they think it's not art. So they rule out right from the start, by their definition, all art that's disturbing. Remember George Brock, the painter in the 20th century, says art is meant to disturb. They rule all of that out by just insisting that if it isn't pretty, it isn't art. And that just doesn't make sense. Nothing that he said offended me because I felt that he was just explaining what he thought, what he believed, and that was fine. He wasn't trying to tell me what I should believe or what other people should believe. So, no, I wasn't offended. There's no right not to be offended by ideas in a classroom. Certainly there, there, there's behavior that should not occur in a classroom. But offensive ideas uh, are ideas, and they can legitimately be presented and entertained and critiqued even, whether people are offended or not. Being offended is okay. I hear a lot of things day in and day out that offend me. That's part of growing up in this society. It's about growing up in the world. You have, to, you have to learn to deal with other people being different than you are and sometimes possibly offending you. Well, you always have the right uh, to walk out of a class and not come back if you're very offended by what goes on there. Nobody's forced to attend uh, a class taught by Doug DiBianco or anybody else or, or to even attend this university. They're not a captive audience. Nobody's a captive audience here. Uh, everybody has the right to leave if they don't like what's going on or take another course taught by somebody else. You can be a very conservative religious person. That's fine. You have a right to be a conservative religious person. But what you don't have a right to do is, is shape the, the contours of a course around your particular uh, the prejudices or outlooks you bring into a classroom. One of the things that a classroom is not supposed to do, and education itself is not to, supposed to do for that matter, is to simply reinforce your prejudices because you're paying money. Uh, a university and a good, a good instructor will, will shake things up a little bit and try to get the student to see things from perspectives the student may not have seen those things from before. And that will sometimes be uh, about challenging the student. A student can feel challenged by what, by what the professor brings up. Well, first of all, if you're a sensitive individual, I don't know how you, you know, walk out of your house in the morning because 
things are out there everywhere that will offend you. On the radio, on TV, on billboards, and newspapers. There are offensive ideas everywhere. And to say somehow that, that college classrooms should be this special zone of protection for your delicate sensitivities, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Colleges and university classrooms should be precisely where your ideas get challenged more than anywhere else, where you're more likely to get offended. For example, if, uh, if we're talking about Freudian analysis uh, in, a, in a music class or an art class or a literature class, and uh, it becomes uh, uh, necessary or at least uh, you know, a good thing to do to, to bring up uh, penis envy, it, well, if you have a very conservative student who, who just doesn't want to hear the word penis, well, then does that mean the professor cannot do Freudian analysis in an art class? Obviously, I don't think it does. I think that, that's where, where the uh, religious student has to be tolerant of, of the, uh, the overall goal of the class and the overall goal of education in general. If they, if they don't want to do that, then possibly they shouldn't go to a secular university and take, and take classes of a secular nature because they're going to run into things that will challenge them now and then. So, I mean, if you're really in a, offended by hearing ideas that disagree with you, you know, it's very easy for you to major in uh, something, you know, major in mathematics, and hopefully you won't hear any mathematical theories that offend you. Uh, I, I think if you, if you really have that delicate sensibility, then, uh, then I don't know why you want to pursue an education. And I think part of a college education is challenging people's views that they should have that, that sensibility. And what we're missing is the, what freedom really is essential to is the idea of higher education not as a product, but as a, as a fundamental part of our democracy, where people have their ideas heard and challenged, where they're offended sometimes, where they don't just get what they want. They meet academic standards. They, they read books even if they don't want to read them. And so the consumer model of higher education to me is a real danger to academic freedom. I don't exactly know what to do. If I cut all that stuff out, and obviously I could cut it all out. I, I, I don't have to talk about any of those things. I don't really have to. But I think they get a much worse education, and I wouldn't be giving them what I think I'm really qualified to give them. And then they may not get many other places. They only take one music course, by and large, a lot of people. These are all non-majors in elective courses. If I don't talk about what is art, how do you judge art, make some points about that, where are they going to get it? I have no worries for the future of the world. I mean, if people are making two girls one cup and other people are analyzing it, I think the world is in pretty good shape. You know, we just don't all agree about certain things, and I just, you know, think it's okay to talk about penises in class. How do you get psyched up to, you know, shit in a cup and then start eating it or, or throw up into another woman's mouth? Um, you know, that takes courage, just like Beethoven had courage. You know, we were watching Horn and the OJ chase, just flipping back and forth. And um, the porn was much more interesting than the OJ chase. I mean, the OJ chase shit is just this fucking Bronco going, you know, umpteen miles an hour and cops behind it and and uh, you know the whole world was looking at it and I thought the porn was much more interesting. Actually I had sex with this guy and then he showed me his bathroom. He says, you know I like to bathe in my own urine. And I said, really? And so he shows me this closet in his bathroom. He's got these liters of you know, these Coca-Cola bottles and and what, they're seven up bottles or something, they're filled with urine. When he's trying to tell me about things, I've, there's definitely been times where I've like closed my ears like, Daddy, I don't want to hear it. 
okay, that guy that puts his feces in a jar, great, and they just explode it, or you know, or sometimes I'm like, that's gross, we're eating. You know, there's there's moments I'd be like, yeah, let's not talk about this right now. I hate that word feces, by the way, it's so stupid. What feces? Can people just say shit? You know, people always talk about feces because they really don't want to say shit. So I think they ought to either say shit or say excrement, but I think we need to forget this feces thing. So we never bathed in any urine. And I don't have any problem with it. I mean, I don't want to bathe in my urine, but if somebody wants to bathe in their urine, what's the big deal? In fact, I have a friend in town who drinks his own urine because he thinks it's good for your health. And I guess it has good properties to it.